So, good morning. There's a chair here, but it is strictly a prop. <laughs> you know I won't be sitting, because if you watched the video from last week and I tried to sit and I got my microphone caught in there, you know what, I'm going to switch to the handheld today. I tried to sit in a chair and I went to get up and the microphone got caught and then the thing went off my ear and things like that. So anyway, so this week, great week, preparing for this morning, had it in my heart, um, exactly what God wanted to say. Uh, last night about nine o'clock, I'm sitting at home and God was like, put those notes away. Love when he does that. I'm thinking to myself, all right, it's going to be another two or three o'clock in the morning kind of night. But it wasn't. But there's something that I feel as though that God just stopped me in my tracks and a word that I needed to share for today. And it, it all started on, I believe on Thursday, um, I had gone over to Shelly's house to pray with Rick, Ricky before this, his surgery. And it was the first time I met Ricky. Uh, we, had a, we had a good time joking around and we had a chance to pray. But later that day, go, on my way home from work, that God had me send a text to, um, to Shelly because he, had, he, he put on my heart to remind her that God's timing is always perfect. How many people know that? God's timing is always perfect. How many people doubt that sometimes? Okay, you can be honest and raise your hand sometimes because sometimes, you know, he's not early. I, some of you guys, I love you, you're here early and things like that. And, and so, I'm not like that all the time. And I wish once in a while, God would just be a little early just to save my blood pressure or just, just to save me a little bit of, of angst and worry. But it's not like that, is it? But even though he's, never, or he's not early most times, he's never late. He's never late. Sometimes, you know, it, it seems as like that, that he loves those fantastic finishes. He loves those last minute, you know, I would say Hail Marys, but it, well, those last minute, um, you know, miracle finishes. And so many times in our life, that, that's what God does. And why does he do it? And we're going to get into that a little bit today. But God's timing is always perfect. And I say that to you with all the confidence in the world. You may say, well, Pastor Bill, you don't know what I'm going through. And it just seems as though it keeps getting darker and darker and the pain is greater and greater. God's timing is always perfect. I want to read from Habakkuk chapter two, verses one to four in the New King James. It says, I will stand my watch and set myself on the rampart and watch to see what he will say to me. And what I will answer when I'm corrected. Verse two, then the Lord answered me and said, write a vision, write the vision, make it plain on tablets that he may run with it who reads it. For the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it will speak and will not lie. Though it tarries, wait for it because it will surely come. I will not tarry. Behold the proud, his soul is not upright in him but the just shall live by faith. I want to also read it to you this morning in a little different translation, in the New, Li New Living Translation. It says it a little bit differently, but we, as we put the two together, it says, I will climb up to my watchtower and stand at my guard post. There I will wait to see what the Lord says and how he will answer. Verse two, then the Lord said to me, write the answer plainly on tablets so that a runner can carry the correct message to others. This vision is for a future time. It describes the end and it will be fulfilled. If it seems slow in coming, wait patiently for it will surely take place. It will not be delayed. Look at the proud. They trust in themselves and their lives are crooked, but the righteous will live by their faithfulness to God. You know, I love the part in verse two, it says, write, write it plainly on tablets so that a runner can carry it, so the runner can carry the correct message to others. How many people know sometimes if we don't have something written, then we can lose the translation? If, I, if we played that game, you know, that we used to play as kids whisper down the lane. If I started with Kevin and told him something, he whispered it to Dana and, and, and um, she whispered it to Vanessa. By the time we got all over here to Austin, who knows what in the world it would say. 
thank God that the scripture was written down, that it wasn't just someone's memory. I don't know about you, but my memory is not that great. And it, it's not getting better. Well, I shouldn't confess that. But, but how, how important is it so that the runner can carry the correct message to others? We need to carry the correct message to others, don't we? We can't just, we can't just carry our opinions it's so easy to pray our opinions in a situation rather than, Lord, thy will be done. It's so easy to do that. And, I, and, I, and I'm, I'm sure that in the past I found myself doing that. How about you? You're praying your opinion. You're praying your daughter's boyfriend right out of her life because you don't like him. You're praying things that you, you, you just, 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 Lord, erase, not, not erase them, like literally, but just get them out of my kid's life. Thank God he doesn't answer my stupid prayers sometimes. Look at the proud. They trust in themselves and their lives, their lives are crooked. But the righteous will live by their faithfulness to God. Or in the New King James, the righteous shall live by faith. That's the way we live is by faith. And by faith means you don't know what tomorrow holds. By faith means that you don't know where two steps ahead are. He says his, his word is a light unto our path, which means we're only seeing right in front of us. It's not a floodlight three miles down the road. It's a light unto our path. That's, that's the guarantee. That's what he's given us. So why can we trust God's timing? Let me ask you, why can we trust God's timing? He knows what's best. Amen. Genesis 1, in the very first verse, it says, In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The reason why we know God, we can trust in God's perfect timing is he created time. And he rules over it. So I, I would venture to say that I can trust the God who invented time for his timing. I love my sister. And she's the first one to admit this. But she's late for everything. Don, didn't you say that about Kim? She was late for her own birth or something like that. <laughs> I forget what you say. But there are some people that are so late. And, 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 and when, I, when, when she says, I'll be there at 10, I'm thinking to myself, she'll probably roll in about 10, 20, 10, 30. She's on her own time. God bless her. You know? And I'm not saying that I'm always exactly on time. But we can trust God. Die, if you're watching, I apologize. The three under the bus there. Uh, she does watch. Um, but we can trust God's timing because he's the one who created time and he rules over it. God operates not on our calendar, but on an eternal calendar. Psalm 90 verses 1 and 2 says, Lord, though the generations, through the generations you have been our home. Before the mountains were created, before the earth was formed, you are God without beginning or end. So he works on his calendar, not my calendar. I'm not necessarily a calendar person. Anybody here calendar people? My wife has both hands up. <laughs> Some people are calendar people and I'm envious of that because they know, I'm so thankful when I remember to put something on my calendar. And then 15 minutes before it happens, I get an alarm saying, oh, wow, I totally forgot about that. But I need to be in a certain place. But we work on his calendar. We can be assured in God's timing because God's delays never destroy his plans. His delays never destroy his plans. Have you ever felt as though you've been delayed with God? Oh my gosh, Lord. We were, we, things were going so well. And then this happens, this delay. I, I, I did a devotion a couple of years ago and, and shared it with the church about, I was at Cooperstown. We're getting ready to play. I go there a couple times, once a year. We play three games with a bunch of guys. And one of the first day we got there, we were rained out. Boy, I can't stand rainouts. Rainouts are so like, 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 especially when you're in uniform, ready to go, and the skies open up. And you know, in baseball, you can't play baseball in the rain. So it, it's, it's so, it, it seems like such a downer. But you know, sometimes God's rainouts are for a reason. God's rainouts are, are to make us, maybe to settle us down. Maybe that we take the focus off of us and put the focus more on him. 
I love Galatians 4, the way it brings this out. And first, starting verse 1, think of it this way. If a father dies and leaves an inheritance for his young children, these children are not much better off than the slaves until they grow up. Even though they actually own everything that the father had. Verse 2, they have to obey their guardians until they reach whatever age their father set. And that's the way it is. It, it, that's the way it was with us before Christ came. We were like children. We were slaves to the basic spiritual principles of this world. But when the right time came, God sent his son, born of a woman, subject to the law. God sent him to buy freedom for us who were slaves to the law. So we could, he could adopt us as his very own children. And because we are his children, God sent his spirit, sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, prompting us to call out, Abba, Father. You are no longer a slave, but God's own child. And since you're his child, God has made you his heir. So think of it. So father passes away, leaves everything to his seven-year-old son. Everything, the whole kingdom. But you know what? The seven-year-old son does not get everything at seven years old. He gets it at an appointed time. Why is that? Because I don't know if a seven-year-old can be trusted with the keys to the kingdom. So it's, it's, a, it's an appointed time that it's handed over to them. And then he owns everything. And there was an appointed time for us. There's some, one thing about being born to our parents. There's another thing about, being, about adopting someone, isn't it? Because as children from my mother, there was no choice. But when, when we adopt someone, that's a choice saying, I want this child to be part of my family. And that's what God did for us. He said, I am, I'm, he adopted us. And he doesn't say that we're just his children. It would be great just to be his children. But he calls us heirs. What's an, what's an heir? Not A-I-R, but H-E-I-R. What's an heir? What's that? Someone who's going to inherit. So we inherit, and like you said, we don't deserve it. It's not because something that was merited, but it was something that we inherit. And what exactly do we inherit? We inherit everything. We're no longer a slave, but God's own child. And since we're his child, God made, has made you an heir. There's some things... Miss B, I'll pick on you. Your son, Bruce, if he comes to me and says, I want to be like your, I want to be like one of your kids, and I want you to give me the portion of what you're leaving for your kids, what sense does that make? I mean, we're brothers in Christ. There's one thing about, you know, but if my child comes up and says it, that's a different story, isn't it? That's a different story. We can have that conversation. But someone who's not mine, how dare they ask for, for something that, you know, that belongs to somebody else? And God is saying, you need to erase that thinking when it comes to him. Because everything that belongs to him belongs to us. Because we're heirs. Every time I read this scripture, I have to ask for forgiveness. For not living my life like an heir of the Most High God. I have to ask forgiveness for constantly seemingly live below the things that he's provided for me. When we're waiting on God, he gives us some instructions. How many times have you had your, your little kids or your grandkids and you're at the park and you want to just hold their hand for safety, but what do they want to do? They want to run. They just want to run. They don't care about how slow you're going. They just want to run. And one of the things that while we're waiting on God, we can't run ahead of him. It's so easy to do, isn't it? He gives us a little speckle of what tomorrow holds and we are already making plans, reservations, you know, selling the farm and we're, and he's saying, whoa, 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 whoa. Don't run ahead of God. Psalm 27, starting in verse 11. Teach me how to live, O God, O Lord. Lead me along the right path for my enemies are waiting for me. Don't let me fall into their hands, for they accuse me of things I've never done. With every breath, they threaten me with violence. 
Yet I am confident I will see the Lord's goodness while I'm standing here in the land of the living. Verse 14, love this verse. Wait patiently for the Lord, be brave and courageous. And then he reminds us, yes, wait patiently for the Lord. Don't you wish he would have used something else there instead of wait patiently? Doesn't that seem like an oxymoron, like waiting patiently? Like that's, but that's how he wants us to wait, patiently. How many people love waiting on the Lord? Why? Because we want the things of God in the microwave. We want the things, we want to put it, put it in, press the, press the blessing button. We don't even want to mess with, the, with, the, with all the other buttons. We just want to hit popcorn or blessing or whatever. And that's what we want. And we expect God to, to, to provide like that. There are some things that he provides like that, but not everything. And thank God, because sometimes things need to slow cook. Everybody's invited over our house today. We're going to have, we're going to watch the football game and I'm making a turkey in the microwave. So it'll be really quick. So no one will really have to wait. They're like, we're not going to his house. No, it's really, it's a 20 pound turkey. It'll cook like in 10 minutes, right? No, some things just have to take time. And some things that take time, we, we, we value a little bit more, don't we? I... I love bragging on something when I, oh, babe, I forgot to put the thing in the crock pot this morning. I love putting something in the crock pot, letting it cook either all night or all day. And when you get home and you just smell that. And I am so proud. I can't wait to tell everybody. You know, Dan will call me on the phone. Hey, what time is this? Dan, I got to tell you, the house smells great because I, I've been cooking something and it, we're so proud of it. The things that take time, except when it comes to the things of the Lord, we want it like that. While we're in this maybe delay, look for God's purpose in the delay. Because God's delays prepare us. Excuse me, God's delays protect us. Have you ever thought of that? I read something this week. I read a testimony, not a testimony, but I read an account of all these people that were supposed to be someplace, but they weren't. Some got caught in traffic. Some, their kid threw up before they left before school. Some, you know, for different things. Some didn't feel good. Some, the car wouldn't start. Some, all these different things. I read about 50 different things of the delayed people on this certain day. And it was 9-11. Thank God for divine interruptions. Thank God for, for de divine delays. Psalm thirty-three twenty says, we wait in hope for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. Don't despise traffic. Don't despise the person in front of you in the 10 items or less line that has 40. Right? Maybe you're there for a reason. Maybe God's protecting you from something. I remember some, one night that I was supposed to be, I was supposed to meet my wife someplace. I forget the time. Let's just say five o'clock. And I got home at 4.15 and I thought, oh, I got plenty of time. Do what I have to do, meet her at five o'clock. Well, I was taking the trash bin in from the house before I even got into the house. And this guy was walking the street. I may have told this story before. This guy was walking around on the street, walking his dog. And I get into a conversation with him and a conversation about the things of the Lord, about salvation, about what a horrible life he had. Next thing I know, it's like six o'clock. And my phone was in the car because I wasn't expecting to be there that long. She is freaking out because she's thinking the worst. She's going to come home and find me like laying out somewhere. But that divine interrupt, I should have been responsible and let her know that. But that time, that thing that it stopped my day may have had eternal consequences because someone heard the gospel message. And once I told her I was going that, she was like, okay, you're good. I forgive you. Divine delays sometimes, they prepare us. Isaiah 30, 40, 30, 18 says, So the Lord must wait for you to come to him so he can show you his love and compassion. For the Lord is a faithful God. Blessed are those who wait for his help. 
There's a part of scripture that I thought was in there for the longest time because my grandmother said it all growing up and I thought it was gospel. It wasn't until I've, I've, I was in Bible college and I bought a, uh, someone gave me a Dakes Bible. It's a, very, it's a very extensive study Bible. And in there, like lost in a tiny, I couldn't read it today because the print is so tiny, but in the tiny print, there was a list of like 25 things that people think are in the Bible that aren't. Did you know that cleanliness is next to godliness is not scripture? So there was something in there. I thought, oh my word. I took this as gospel the whole time. My grandmother used to always say, if you want something done right, you do it yourself. Right? Right? And so many times that's correct. Because you're like, you know, Pastor, I'll come in, I'll come in Sunday mornings and I'll make the coffee. And, and maybe the first time they make the coffee, you're going to taste it and it's like mud. That's okay. That's okay. Divine delays prepare us. Divine delays direct us. Psalm 25, verses 4 and 5. Make me known your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. For you, I will wait 10 minutes. It says, for you, I will wait all the day. All the day. So he directs us. He prepares us protects us and that's all delays the um there's a a church in ferris hills pennsylvania that i interned at after bible college or during bible college and the pastor of the church just recently passed away uh about a month ago i think he was 88 um and he was in the middle of a sermon a sermon series for the past month or so when he got an opportunity to preach and he was talking about god's divine interruptions Now, his son was assistant pastor and his grandson um, is on staff there also. So, Pastor Farina passes away, goes to, goes to glory. And you would think, I remember hearing at the, at the um, um, funeral service about divine interruptions. It was almost like people were being prepared that, you know what, there's going to be a, a divine interruption. And let me tell you, after that, there's like, everybody can stand around and say, well, the pastor's gone. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? You know what they did? They called for a time of prayer and fasting. And what God is doing in their church right now is bringing a revival because it's not looking about what we don't have. It's looking to God who is the author and finisher of our faith and seeing what is the mission. That All that series was just pre- preparation. And I'm not saying that this preparation is me going anywhere <laughs> or, or, or anything like that. But we know, and, and trust me, I know you know too, because you've, if you've been a Christian for any length of time, you know what I'm talking about, about delays and inconveniences and interruptions. And God is saying, don't lose faith. In those times, when we're waiting, expect God to come through. While we're waiting, I'm going to read Isaiah chapter 40, starting in verse 27. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord, and my just claim is passed over by my God. Have you not known, have you not heard? The everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth neither faints nor is weary his understanding is unsearchable he gives power to the weak and to those who have no might he increases strength even the youths shall faint and be weary and the young men shall utterly fall but verse 31 but those who wait on the lord shall renew their strength they shall mount up with wings like eagles They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. It's not the young, necessarily. It's not the strong. It's not the well-educated. But it's those who wait on the Lord. 
This is one of my favorite scriptures. They shall renew their strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not be weary. They'll walk and not faint. This is a promise to us. I was reading this week about eagles, not E-A-G-L-E-S, eagles. Um, but I was reading about eagles and I read this story about this, this eaglet who was dropped in a chicken coop. And he was forgotten about. So he just starts cackling around like the chickens. Do chickens cackle? Or whatever chickens do. They start running around like a chicken. And I know chickens are fast because I remember in the movie Rocky, he was trained to try and catch the chicken. And he was working on footwork trying to catch a chicken. Well, this eagle is being raised by chickens. And this mother eagle or whatever is flying over and they look down and they're like, what is that eagle doing in the chicken coop? He's like, what are you doing? He's like, oh my God, I wish I could fly like you. And they're like, you can. Because we're surrounded with chickens, we think like chickens. We act like chickens. But when we remember that we're eagles, that changes the story, doesn't it? The world is trying to get us to conform. But what does the Bible say? Don't be conformed to the things of the world. Isn't everything in the world trying to get us to conform? You know, it used to be that you go by a McDonald's, it was like a happy place. It was red and yellow. Now they're like black and gray. It's like, they look like Starbucks. Like everybody's just conforming to a way, to a look. We conform maybe the way we, like the world, the way they dress. They just, they want us to conform. But God is saying, don't conform to the things of the world, but be transformed. How do we, how are we transformed? What does it say? By the renewing of our minds. By the renewing of our mind. Don't think that just because you hang out with a bunch of chickens that you're a chicken. Remember who God called us to. And maybe this is a reminder to somebody that they will, they will mount up with wings like eagles. They'll run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. I believe that that's a word for someone today that you don't give up. Whatever you're believing God for, don't give up. Have you ever flipped through the TV and you're flipping stations and there's a show or a movie that you just stop and you just have to watch it? You know, there, there's just certain things and maybe from our past, there's like, it takes us back to a time and you just have to stop and watch it. Last weekend... I, I guess uh, we were getting ready to go out and I told Kelly, it only has 30 more minutes. We just gotta, we just gotta watch the end. And it's the movie, Evan Almighty. Anybody ever see that? Evan Almighty. So it's where um, U.S. Senator is confronted by God. And it was a story basically of Noah. And he's saying, be prepared, build an ark. Now it's, you know, the 2000 somethings, be prepared, build an ark. Why in the world would we be prepared and build an ark? And, and, he, and as, the, as the movie went, God started doing things to him. So he, he gets up to one morning, he starts noticing he's grown a lot of facial hair. And he shows up at work one day, you know, with, go, he went to work in a suit, but next thing you know, he's in like, um, he's dressed like Noah, like with a, what is things they wore? Robe or yeah, something like that. So and one day he, 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 he gets the robe and he tucks it in his suit and he's so, and he's standing there with a long, he put his hair in a ponytail and he's standing there before Congress and all of a sudden something happens and he's dressed like Noah. And they're all getting ready to censor him and, and, and tell him he's going to lose his thing. And then next thing you know, all these animals, all these birds start flying in and flocking next to him. He's driving home from work and there's like all these animals following him. So God is trying to get his attention. So he, he, he is obedient to build the ark. He starts building an ark. In his nice classy neighborhood, he starts building an ark. And the premise was, he want, they moved out to the suburbs so he can be with his kids. He, never, he can never spend time with his kids. He wanted to spend time with his kids. So now this ark is being built. And his family thinks he's nuts. His neighbors think he's nuts. But everywhere he goes, everywhere he turns, 
the Lord is talking to him. Everywhere he turns. So the, the, the wife says, you know what? After that latest fiasco with the animals, like we're going to my mother's house. She's on her way to her mother's house and she's having lunch at this restaurant with the kids. And the kids use the restroom and she's sitting there and this waiter who comes by, who is Morgan Freeman, who, who plays God. And he says, what's the matter? And she goes on to, to, you can go to the next slide. She goes on to talk about the things that are going, that, that life just, that's kind of the way he looked. <laughs> um, but one of, the, one of the phrases in the movie just, just struck me. He says, let me ask you something. If someone prays for patience, do you think God gives, them, God gives them patience? Or does he give them the opportunity to be patient? If they pray for courage, does God give them courage or does he give them opportunities to be courageous? If one prays for their family to be closer, do you think God zaps them with warm fuzzies? Or does he give them opportunities to love each other? And that just smacked me in the face. You know, the things that we pray for, we pray through our own lens. And yet God is working it out. And my question to you today is, do we trust him enough to be working behind the scenes? Do we trust him to, to, to know he's working even when we can't see it? Faith is not seeing. Seeing is seeing. Faith is believing things that we can't see, but knowing that it's happening. What does the Bible say about faith? Faith is the substance of what? Things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. How can faith have evidence? Let me ask you, have you ever stepped out in faith and God met you where you were? Let me tell you, Asking Jesus in your heart is a huge step of faith because it makes no sense to the world. It makes no sense to the carnal mind. Asking Jesus in your heart is the first step of faith because guess what? After you ask Jesus in your heart, is there a certificate he gives you? Is there something you could put in your wallet like similar to your voter registration card or your driver's license that says, saved? You know, in case I die, DNR, because I'm going to heaven. No, there's, there's no card like that. Our whole premise of salvation is based on faith. You don't have to answer this out loud. But can anybody talk you out of your faith? Can anybody talk you out of your relationship with God? Why? People are trying every day, aren't they? People are trying to let you, like, make you think that there's no God. You're a fool for believing for God, believing in God. But God uses the foolish things of the world, he says, to confound the foolish things of the world, to confound the wise. What are you praying for today? You don't have to say that out loud. What are you praying for today? We may think we know how the answer is going to come, but can we trust God that if we're praying for patience, he's not going to zap us and say, okay, you have patience now. No, he's going to, you know, put us in situations where we have to use patience. If we're praying for courage, are we, are we automatically, go, we're going to go into the phone booth like Clark Kent and come out of the phone booth like Superman? It's not like that. I wish it was. They don't even have phone booths anymore. If we ask to be, to be closer with each other, is it just a matter of having a fellowship dinner and everybody in the church showing up? No. It, it's opportunities to be together. It's opportunities. It's being with each other when, you know, in times, when times are bad. Praying with each other in the hospital. Praying with each other in times of need. That's what we're here for. And we don't, again, we don't just pray our intentions. We need to pray the will of God. The Bible says there's times that we don't even know what to pray. Anybody ever been there? And at times like that, we need to, we need to rely on the Holy Spirit who prays through us. So, so I, I hope that... Um, I, 
I hope that you needed, someone here needed to be reminded that God's timing is perfect. Before we close this morning, there have been a couple of people that have um, been in conversation um, and asked that, you know, one of the most powerful things that we have at our disposal is our testimony, right? Revelation says we defeat the enemy by the blood of the lamb and the word of our testimony. And I just want to open it up here today, not putting anybody on the spot because I think some people may have been preparing for this. But is there a testimony of what God's doing in your life or what God has done for you that you just want to share with the, with the congregation this morning? Again, no pressure, but if, if there's something, I want to give opportunity. I don't want to pass through. Anyone? Next week, we're going to put names in a hat and draw, and then they will. <laughs> no, I just want to give opportunity. Anybody? Yes. Can, you, can I give you this just because people online can't hear anything? Thank you. I, that message was meant for me today. I have struggled because we were set up for transplant, and then something came up, and I have to go through more testing. But I struggled with God's because I feel like this is God's plan and I have struggled all week and I'm like this is God's timing there's some reason for this I'm just trying to find it but I do believe that this is all God's timing all God's plan and there are things that will may or may not present themselves but this is all part of his plan and I I needed to hear that so thank you so that's God's timing here kicking and screaming, but you're here, even here walking. <laughs> Amen. Anybody else? Yes. This isn't really a testimony so much, but you know, we all know how the Holy Spirit works and He speaks to our hearts. And when we hear him and feel him, it's undeniably him. And when we were in praise and worship, I just felt like the Holy Spirit was saying, I've healed somebody today. I've touched somebody today. And I actually just sensed that it was right here in this area. And um, I didn't know who, I didn't know what, but it was so profound within me. Tell my people, tell my congregation that I have touched them and healed them this morning. So I just felt like I needed to speak that. Thank you. I appreciate that because sometimes we need to take a step of faith out like that, don't we? Amen. Anybody else? Anybody need a background? Okay. All right, amen. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much, Lord, for interrupting our regularly scheduled programming this morning. Lord, to, to, to hear from you. Lord, for someone may have come in, such as Kim feeling this way, but Lord, maybe something when we leave these doors that there may be an interruption or a pause. And Lord, the very word today from your word, Lord, is preparation for us. Can I ask that we just take maybe 30 seconds with your heads bowed, eyes closed, just between you and God. I just wanna give opportunity just in the quietness that, that before we leave this place, that we would just search our hearts. Make sure we're right, we're, we're right with God this morning. And that we're hearing what he's saying to us. Lord, I thank you for what you're doing among the people in this congregation, in this body of believers, Lord, in this place for such a time as this. And I pray, Lord, that as we go from this place, Lord, you would give us a boldness that we may not have had before. Lord, to share your word with somebody, to share our testimony with someone. Lord, I thank you that that's the way the kingdom of God is built. Lord, we're interested in building the kingdom of God, not necessarily 
the church of God. But Lord, it's all about your kingdom and it's all about souls. I pray, Lord, you would give us, you've given us the power, Lord, through your Holy Spirit to be a witness. And I pray, Lord, that we would remember in the same way that we, we remember today, Lord, that you call us heirs of your kingdom. And I pray, Lord, that we would walk in that. Lord, I come against any kind of doubt that would try to fill our minds, anything that would try to conform us to the things of the world. But Lord, we make a decision here this morning, Lord, that by the renewing of our mind, that we would be transformed, Father God, to the things of you and not conform to the things of the world. I thank you for this special time today, Lord. We pray these things in your precious name. Amen. 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 God bless you as you go. There's um, Take time to fellowship, whatever you like. Yes, Dan. Thank you, Dan. Um, just in, in, a, in a better way to have some more information, in a situation like last week when we had a cancel service that, you know, I wanted to make sure everybody was contacted. So when you leave, Dan's going to give you a uh, form. If you could just fill it out, you could bring it back next week, whatever. Um, just some information, uh, a couple questions on there uh, so we can better communicate with you. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Dan, for reminding me. You are dismissed.